Okay, thank you for this kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here today in front of all of you. So uh, today uh, I'm going to talk to you about workflow engines. Uh, that's actually the short uh, title of the presentation. What the talk will be really about is um, how a workflow engine or an orchestrator uh, and what role it can play in your microservice architecture. So if this is not what you expected, now would be the time <laughs> to go. So uh, a humble intro besides the one that uh, they did for me. I'm a staff software engineer at Halo Diagnostics. We are a medical startup that hopes to uh, improve the uh, lives of patients through precise diagnostics and in the future through preventative care. Uh, we have some of our nice colleagues are here at the booth, so if you'd like to talk to them, uh, go ahead. Uh, tomorrow we have prepared a nice, uh, nice thing in the entertainment area, especially for the chess enthusiasts. So again, yeah, you can go and join them. But yeah, that enough uh, adv advertisement for the others, some advertisement for me. I have s around eight years of experience, professional experience in the industry. And what I've enjoyed in my career is building end-to-end -end, uh, products. Uh, and I don't mean uh, full stack, I mean more uh, from the beginning of a project to the end. So seeing the early three, five classes and then going to the uh, production and all the problems that it brings. And what fascinates me in, this, in, the, in these journeys is usually the, uh, the effects early architectural decisions have on, uh, yeah, on a project. And today I'm going to describe one such architectural concept and how it can affect your architecture. And yeah, that's uh, workflow engines. So uh, the today's agenda, I'll first describe what's, uh, what I mean by workflow or a business process. We'll see how such business processes are um, yeah, managed. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not something um, uh, that the product actually, so it's something that the product actually cares, but we'll, we'll get to this. I uh, will see uh, what a role a workflow engine uh, has in this, in this whole topic, uh, some benefits of using one, and finally we'll conclude with uh, real world examples, including some from uh, our medical domain. Uh, by the way, that on top, on top right, this is um, a state machine of a traffic light, so keep that in mind, it will be referenced later in the presentation. So, uh, the typical slide in a conference about microservices, uh, I guess you all do them. I'm not going to uh, dive, dive really deep. There are tons of books, presentations, etc. So, and I guess that you are doing this uh, in your day-to-day -day lives. I'll just reiterate some of the benefits of using microservices and how this uh, can be affected uh, by a workflow engine. So basically what we do in, in our day-to-day -day lives is try and somehow manage complexity. So somehow separate uh, services, functions, doesn't matter, uh, but separate them into small components so that they are easier to reason about and to, to manage. Uh, and now with the current trend of microservices, before it was SOA, uh, but it doesn't have to be, it can be some um, modular architecture with modules which are, again, separated nicely from each other, or even um, monolith with separated modules, it still works. So what we really want to end up with are independent pieces of software. So ideally, in a microservice environment, there will be separate teams that each care about one service, and what they only need to um, uh, to, to have is a nice API contract and some SLAs, and that's uh, everything that's needed from uh, a microservice. And this gives the teams uh, autonomy to do basically whatever they want. They can write the service once, they can rewrite it a uh, hundred times, doesn't really matter. Uh, all that matters is that they comply to some kind of API. So, uh, <laughs> again, it's, it's very typical for uh, conference speakers to ask people to raise hands. And yeah, it, they already did that in other sessions. I'm not going to do that. I'll try to bore you with data. Uh, <laughs> this was um, 
a survey done by J Rebel last year where they, um, they were asking organizations uh, about their involvement with microservices. And if you do the math, it's around 87% of organizations are in some way involved, already doing or, or are thinking about uh, going towards microservice architecture. Uh, again, uh, another survey done last year by uh, InfoQ, they do a, a really, really interesting uh, survey at the end of each year where they summarize uh, what's hot right now. Uh, and yeah, they, they decided that, or the results came, that uh, microservices are already considered late majority. Meaning that uh, it's stable technology, I think that everybody is supposed to understand and to do correctly and right. However, <laughs> on that same topic, correctly building distributed systems, which is what microservices are, uh, is our, our actually early majority. Meaning that a lot of people do microservices, but not uh, everyone, everyone does them correctly or understands the implication of a distributed system. And also interesting to note is that uh, the workflow is already popping up. This, this term is already popping up in, yeah, in the early adopter. So companies are beginning to understand what an engine can do for them and actually using it in production. OK. Um, I've tried here to give you an example, and we'll uh, work with this example throughout the whole presentation. Uh, the example I think you can all relate to this is online shopping. Uh, well, besides that everybody does online shopping, uh, in the last two years it really blew up. Uh, it's, it's a very simple, a simple system containing uh, from f of four services that in this case communicate through a message broker. However, the technical details uh, should not be that important. So this uh, message broker could have been gone. Uh, the four services could have talked to each other through some uh, synchronous communication or talking directly by like some asynchronous mean, means. Doesn't really matter uh, for, the, uh, for the system. Uh, what matters is uh, on the right, I've described the order of fulfillment process. Uh, and that's basically the process uh, from checking out some items. Uh, so a client checks out some items, then they proceed to payment. These items are fetched from some inventory, and finally they are uh, shipped to the client, to the customer. Uh, and this is what I mean by uh, a business process or a workflow. So from the uh, product, from the business point of view, uh, this is what they care about. It, uh, for them, it doesn't matter if it's one service or a hundred. Uh, the process of fulfilling an order, that's what's important uh, both for the business and for the, uh, for the customers. Uh, and this is just one example of a process in, in a large system, so they could also be returning of items, uh, there could be refunding of money or resending again. In a fairly large system, they could be I don't know, hundreds of these processes. Okay, here I've tried to describe this as uh, some kind of pseudocode. So in, in a perfect world, this is how our uh, order fulfillment process would look like. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a simple single function. Uh, any of you that's done uh, microservices knows that this is missing error handling. Even with error handling, the code would relatively look like this. Uh, however, in the presence of four different services distributed, this is nearly Im impossible to achieve with this kind of code. Okay. Oh, uh, something else. Mm. Yeah, I, I found a rather interesting quote by Martin Fowler. Uh, he's the guy that names everything in our industry. So in his essay, uh, event, uh, what do you mean by event-driven? He says that it's very easy to make uh, decoupled systems with some kind of event notification, but uh, yeah, we might be losing sight of what's actually happening, what, what's the larger scale flow, and setting ourselves for trouble in future years. And if we go back to our example, we can see that, well, here I've drawn the uh, order fulfillment process and it's just uh, four services with uh, three arrows. That's relatively easy. 
However, not all processes in, no, in not all companies are actually drawn like this. Very few uh, organizations uh, keep an up-to-date architectural documentation of what's actually happening in their system. Uh, what most usually happens is that this is somehow embedded into the code base. So if you need to understand how an order gets uh, fulfilled, you either need to talk to somebody from product, in which the case they have some understanding or at least think that it's happening one way, but the uh, correct, the authoritative uh, way of doing things is, is in the code. And that's not nice, not only all from all people, but for new people as well, since yeah, they have no way of understanding how the system works. So, um, <laughs> another, another survey, another data uh, that I found uh, is from an, an IT company, and they asked their uh, clients what's the, the biggest challenges that they face when dealing with, uh, with microservices. And the number one result was the lack of visibility into end-to-end -end processes, so into end-to-end -end business processes that span through uh, multiple services. A close second uh, is the, uh, the error handling, the, the hardships related to error handling, especially at the boundaries between services. Uh, and number three was communication. The communication between teams is, is always difficult. Doesn't matter what <laughs> was the organization, uh, and the top three problems are actually co very closely related. So, if you imagine an, an, an action or a business process that needs to span, uh, let's say, th to, through ten services, then all of the problems uh, described uh, are very, very likely to occur. So, uh, this. <laughs> This problem was already uh, discovered and actually solved by the Netflix uh, team. Uh, they are, one might say, pioneers in the microservice industry. So uh, more than five years ago, they understood this problem uh, and they, they realized that their processes were orchestrated in an ad hoc manner using I don't know, a combination of REST calls, uh, pops up, uh, database state, uh, cron jobs, possibly. Uh, however, with the growing number of microservices that they had, uh, getting visibility into the whole distributed process uh, became really hard for them. And one example that they give is they were um, often asked, uh, how far are we in the setup of a given movie? So how long would it take until this movie is actually ends up on the Netflix website and people can look at it? And they couldn't answer this. So they had no way of operationally knowing uh, how far the process is. So, uh, what we should strive to balance in a microservice architecture is the, the strengths of microservices and what the, the engineering departments enjoy, which is uh, autonomy and loose coupling. Uh, ideally, we would only care about our service or services. They would be performing some very well encapsulated business action, but that's it. Uh, and we'll somehow loosely collaborate with the others. Uh, what the uh, product or what the business cares about is, well, first, visibility into processes, uh, as I mentioned with the Netflix examples. Uh, also, they would like to um, be able to conform to SLAs, which are service level agreements. Uh, you know the famous example of a pizza delivery service, and if the pizza doesn't uh, come within 45 minutes, you get the pizza for free. Well, that's an SLA, and that's usually enforced uh, by, by the business. And finally, the, uh, the product would like um, to be able to improve on their processes. So today they think that one process is uh, optimal, but they would actually like to try uh, something different. Perhaps it leads to higher revenue or to more checkouts in the website. And we need to find a way to balance between the, the needs of these two parties. So if we go back to our retail example, uh, imagine that somebody from, uh, from business comes to us and says that they have uh, come up with uh, another way to, to do the order fulfillment and they think that this would uh, boost sales. So they say, well, first, uh, let's, uh, after checking out some items, let's immediately fetch them from the inventory and then proceed with the payment. And the logic behind this would be that well, when the uh, client pays, uh, they would immediately uh, get their items shipped, and they would wait uh, uh, 
a, a shorter time, so they would be in the end happier. Uh, another variation of this process might be that, well, after the checking out some items, fetching them from the inventory and the payment happen in, in parallel. Uh, that's also possible, however, this brings other kinds of problems since payment may succeed and checking out may not, and this has to be compensated back. But anyways, what I want to, um, to, to describe with this example is that uh, it's simple to rearrange three arrows for us, uh, well in, while in practice this would most often uh, lead to changes in four services. Uh, and even though the changes might be small, uh, the service owners would still have to synchronize with each other. So all of the four services will at some point in time have to be released so that they match this, this kind of process. Uh, and that's hard and well, we don't want to end up in, in this situation. So you might be thinking, well, why not introduce another separate service that's actually in charge of the order fulfillment process? And this would make sense. Uh, the four services on the left, they will continue to be independent. They can focus only on their public APIs. They can focus only on their SLAs. Uh, and this would actually work. So the, uh, the, the order of fulfillment process itself is, uh, is kind of separate. So it makes sense to separate it in a, in a different service. Uh, and this service will act as kind of an orchestrator for the others. Uh, and while this makes sense, this alleviates some of the, uh, of the burdens of the problems that the other services need to deal with, like this uh, error handling at the boundaries or the boilerplate code related to retries and compensations that need to be done. And all of this complexity moves to the order service. So this orchestrator now has the sole responsibility of keeping the order fulfillment process uh, of keeping it running, even in the presence of, of errors. And in this case, any of these services, oh, it might fail, it might be down uh, for some time, uh, and the order should continue to work. So the order fulfillment process should continue to work. Uh, not only this, this, this process should be aware of actually the time that has passed, because it doesn't make sense if you've, uh, if you've asked for a next day delivery that your items are, uh, item arrives at, I don't know, in a week. So at this point in time, I felt uh, <laughs> necessary to remind you of the fallacies of distributed computing, uh, which are a list of assertions that some smart people at Sun did a long time ago. And they, this basically boils down to uh, the fact that well, distributed computing is hard, and there are many problems that, <laughs> that can happen uh, with it. And going back to the example, the uh, order service will have to deal exactly with this kind of problems. So uh, unreliable networks, retries, uh, compensations, etc. So finally, at uh, slide 16, we come to the what was in the, uh, the talk of the title no, of the title of the talk, uh, and these are workflow engines. And the workflow engine is a software application that manages uh, business processes. And it uh, basically very efficiently handles state, monitors state, and uh, does the transition between the activities in, in a given workflow. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning uh, the um, traffic light state machine. Since workflows are kind of like state machines, and the workflow engine is the thing that does the transitions in these state machines. So if we introduce, let's say we introduce a workflow engine in, in our uh, simple sample uh, system, what this would mean is that we will get rid of the order service, and now the order fulfillment uh, workflow will be just one of the many workflows that this, this engine is capable of doing, and we'll get all the, these benefits. So first we start with uh, the fact that uh, workflow engines manage state very, very efficiently since that's what they were actually built for. Uh, on top of this, they provide visibility and traceability of, of workflows, uh, meaning th yeah, that uh, we can answer usually uh, very easily how far are we in a given process. And uh, usually the workflows, they can be uh, visualized. And th that's very powerful for the business people, since uh, what's in their heads, it 
it's not usually what's in the code base. And if they actually see what's happening, if they can uh, follow, they can more easily um, find improvements or suggest improvements to these processes. Also, user handling of SLAs, uh, the thing with the uh, pizza delivery of 45 minutes, uh, that usually comes out of the box with, with workflow engines. And if we uh, didn't use one, uh, if we don't use one, well, we might end up using some uh, cron jobs uh, or a mixture of this and uh, schedulers. Just not the uh, easiest piece of software to manage. Uh, moreover, in this case, the workflow definitions, uh, so the business process definitions, they are separated uh, from the uh, the microserv the services themselves. And this is a benefit because the workflow engine, it's a separate component that you can think of as, um, as infrastructure. So most usually in a, set in, in a system, it's not the infrastructure that breaks, or even, uh, and if it breaks, everything breaks, uh, but most usually problems are found with the services themselves. And the workflow engine, you can think of as some kind of more stable software that uh, stays there and executes whatever uh, process or workflow you, you decided to give it. Uh, finally, uh, workflow engines, they give you operational control over workflows. So you can uh, start, stop, resume, retry, restart, etc. Uh, for example, uh, say that you ordered something from Amazon and it didn't arrive. Uh, somebody can just go and restart the process from the point uh, so from the point in time after your payment, and it doesn't matter how complex this would be. Uh, it's it's very easy if you have this um, operational control. So uh, here I've listed some uh, workflow solutions that are uh, all of them are uh, open source and free. Uh, first, it Cadence, it was um, developed by Uber and then open sourced again by Uber. Cadence has a very interesting architecture since it borrows a lot from um, not only from the workflow engine world, but also from the actor model world. So they provide something that they call durable functions, meaning that if you describe your workflow in, even if you describe your workflow in Java code and you have a function, uh, they guarantee you that this function will execute in a, a fault oblivious way. Meaning that if some infrastructure problem happens in the midst of executing your function, this will be transparently handled by the workflow engine and for you uh, it, it, won't, it won't happen. So it won't pop up as an error, it will just continue to execute. They promise that. Uh, next, it's uh, Netflix Conductor. Uh, in Conductor, you describe your workflows with uh, JSON DSL. And uh, yeah, uh, workflows there are directed acyclic graphs, meaning that it's usually not, uh, not possible to have long running or uh, repetitive processes. And finally, um, a workflow engine that's a little bit different from, uh, from the others. This is uh, Komunda. Uh, they implement something that's called uh, BPMN which is a shorthand for business uh, process model and notation. In, okay. in, <laughs> in BPMN, uh, you can describe your workflows in a, a very pleasant visual way with boxes and arrows. You, you see I'm, I'm using this notation in a few slides. I won't uh, bore you with it. Won't, yeah. mm. And uh, this uh, BPMN standard, uh, it's, it's an open standard, meaning that in theory you should be able to exchange your workflow engine if you just use the, this open standard. So, should you be using a workflow engine? Uh, of course, the answer as always is it depends. Uh, an engine is a, a separate um, component in your architecture, meaning that it needs to be deployed, it needs to be uh, operated, it needs to be managed, monitored. Uh, all the application teams in your company will have to learn about this workflow engine. They will have to learn to use it efficiently. Uh, so basically you should uh, try and balance the, uh, its, its strengths uh, to the costs that it brings. Uh, 
However, uh, I'll now try to give you some use cases in which I think you as engineers and your or, uh, engineering organization might, might benefit from using an engine. Uh, and the first one I think would be most common uh, for uh, everyone here, and that's being in a situation with a lot of microservices. And uh, for some, a lot means something, from others, I it's different number, uh, but I get you have a sense of what I mean by a lot. <laughs> uh, a colleague of mine told me an anecdotal example of a project in which there were 10 developers and 10 microservices, I hope you are not in this situation. <laughs> I hope you did your decisions <laughs> better. Uh, but let's say that you've ended up in this situation. So you either ended up uh, there or you inherited a project and it has a ton of little microservices. So for every operation that needs to be done, for every simple action that the product team decides that they want, you have to go through, uh, let's say, five microservices or ten. Uh, and then you have to explain yourself, well, why, uh, why adding this simple button uh, would take us uh, three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a workflow engine in this case would be helpful since it will remove a lot, a lot of boiler, boilerplate code from each of the services uh, and would move, the, move this to the, um, to the engine. Uh, and this would leave these microservices with just, the, uh, yeah, just their core business functionality, and the developers there should focus only on this core business functionality. Yeah, um, next on the list are distributed transactions. Um, by the way, that's, uh, that's BPMN, so uh, this is how the BPMN uh, workflows look like. Uh, I hope it's relatively easy to understand. In this case, the, uh, the workflow is waiting, uh, so it's when a payment is requested, this workflow is triggered. It then does two tasks. First, using uh, the customer credit to uh, pay for, for an item, and then uh, fetch this same item uh, from the inventory. However, what happens if during the fetching from the inventory there's an error and we need to roll back the whole transaction? Uh, this is not possible or in, a, in a distributed environment. It's, it's not possible since the, these can be you know, several different services. So what we need to do is do a compensating action. Uh, in this case, well, we use the customer credit. We should restore the customer credit. Uh, however, the uh, act of restoring the credit can also fail uh, since, again, that, that's a service and it could, again, not work at some point in time. We don't want to end up in a situation where we took uh, money or took credit from the client and then uh, didn't give it back to them and didn't give them product. Uh, so this uh, restoration, it, it also has to be retried. It also need, or we need to wait until the service is up and fully functionally running. So if, if this sounds familiar to you, uh, it should, because that's uh, what I'm describing, is the saga pattern uh, for distributed transactions. And this pattern comes really naturally in, in an, uh, or by using a workflow engine. <coughs> so um, another use case uh, in which you might employ an engine uh, is if you need to um, to perform. So if your customers need to perform some manual tasks, uh, there are a lot of uh, mission critical processes in which which organizations have, which still rely on on some manual labor or some manual tasks to be performed. Uh, even if a task can be op uh, automated, it doesn't matter that uh, it it. Sh well, it shouldn't always be automated at all costs. It's not always practical. Uh, and in some cases, well, it's not possible. So uh, in sometimes, even if um, a machine does some work, a person needs to confirm that, uh, basically most often for liability reasons. And somebody has to be responsible if something happens at the end. Uh, and yeah, here a workflow engine can also be very helpful since it can distribute tasks uh, very easily to, to, different, um, to different people to actually perform these tasks. Uh, but also some engines support more uh, fancier 
ways of routing tasks, for example, by skill, or if a task has priority, then the person that does tasks the faster, they would get this one, so it gets uh, done uh, first. Uh, also, some engines, they support uh, doing tasks uh, using the what's called the four eyes principle. Uh, that's usually employed in the financial uh, sector, in which case, when a task is performed, another person needs to uh, go there and check uh, the work done by the first person, so that finally this task uh, is considered done. Okay, uh, another slightly uh, different use case for using engines would be uh, just as uh, passive listeners. So imagine your situation in a situation where your uh, services are uh, running well very well. Uh, they don't need to be uh, tweaked in any way, or you don't have the budget for this. They're just there and they work. So if you end up in a situation with such kind of ser kinds of services and the um, ability or the option to, to use a workflow engine, it can be set, that set up that it just listens for what happens in your system uh, and then visualizes it in some uh, nice way like this. Now that's heat map of one, given, uh, of one example process. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, that's very useful uh, for business people since uh, you can understand that looking at, ta uh, at numbers uh, and reports is not as useful as looking at this since it looks way, way prettier. Okay. Um, another use case for using a workflow engine would be uh, configurability and extensibility. So you know that uh, your, uh, our software usually uh, gets, um, gets customized uh, for each different client. And uh, sometimes this customization, uh, it takes too, too long or it's too difficult to perform. There are hundreds of screens with little boxes in which you need to tweak your system exactly the way you want it. And the most hard part is that you often need to uh, tweak it in a way that it actually makes sense to be tweaked, since sometimes uh, uh, settings collide with each other. Uh, well, workflow engines help in, in, this, in this matter, since uh, most of them, they, uh, they offer a declarative way of describing workflows. So it's very easy to uh, either rearrange items in a, in a JSON list or rearrange boxes and arrows in BPMN, uh, and that's very easy. Um, another, another point is extensibility. So um, I think, OK, I, I have an example for extensibility, so I'll just uh, go straight to it. Uh, that's taken from our day-to-day uh, -day job, from my day-to-day -day job at uh, Halo Diagnostics. That's from the uh, medical domain. We as a company operate uh, medical centers. So in these centers, patients are supposed to uh, come and have some procedures done to them, let's say on x-ray. Uh, so we expect that the patient arrives at uh, their scheduled time. Uh, however, what happens if they don't? So if they're late with 15 minutes, in this case, we've set up our uh, workflow that they are automatically put up for rescheduling. Um, if they come uh, during this time when they're up for rescheduling, though, uh, and yeah, that, that's a human task. That's a task actually for a human to perform. So if a person comes late, but we still um, know that well, we can still perform the procedure, it doesn't matter that you're uh, one hour late, we'll still do, still do the procedure. That's an example actually of a, of a manual human task that needs to be performed. So if the patient still manages, manages to arrive, well, we complete this task. And uh, this will easily, very easily uh, show you the um, power uh, of extensibility and configurability, since imagine that uh, a different center, well, they don't want to wait uh, 15 minutes, they would like to wait the whole day. So if the patient at any given point in time in that day still uh, arrive at the center, well, we perform the procedure and it yeah, doesn't matter. Other centers, uh, well, they might not have rescheduling at all, so they just 
wait for the patient to arrive at any point in time. In which case, we'll, well, one will change the, the time, so the 15 minutes. In the other case, we'll just remove the rescheduling box. And talking about extensibility, uh, imagine being in, a, um, in one of these centers and having to, um, to operate a, a legacy system. So every time a patient arrives in your facility, you need to trigger some manual action in, a, in, a, um, uh, in an old system that, I don't know, uh, starts to prepare the medical equipment uh, for this patient. Uh, if we were in a regular project, uh, this would mean custom integration, and this custom integration will have to be done uh, differently and separately for each uh, each of these uh, legacy systems. And I don't know, you guess. Uh, I guess that you know that that's not the nicest thing to to do as engineering. Uh, what can be done with, with a workflow engine is just another arrow that points to a task, and this task can be anything that you would like, usually some kind of um, API call, but it can be a message, it can be anything. Uh, and in, in this case, well, it will just trigger this manual action in this, in this legacy system. Okay, we finally come to my last example, and I'm 14 minutes early. <laughs> okay, um, this example I stole shamelessly for a presentation of Uber Cadence. Uh, the, the presenter before me said that he doesn't own the rights to any of the, uh, the pictures. I don't own them as well. <laughs> Uh, in their case, they describe the, their order of fulfillment process. That's basically food delivery. Uh, in, in their case, uh, they first place an order. The order get, gets picked up from the restaurant. Uh, some uh, dispatch time is estimated. Then uh, a Uber driver is dispatched. Food is picked up and delivered. And finally, money exchanges hands. And at the end, the client gets their food. Uh, this, as you can imagine, is, is a very long running process. So this can take, I don't know, usually you would like the, uh, your food to be delivered in 30 minutes, but it can take hours. Imagine some remote location. Uh, and uh, Uber implemented this workflow uh, using Cadence. Uh, and from data that I tried to find, they, uh, they have around 30% of the food delivery business in the US. Uh, and they, at least they, they say that they have more than 60 million customers a month. Uh, I would imagine that some of these customers, they order more than once. So you can, uh, you can do the math and find out how many of these workflows are, are um, done every day. Uh, and Cadence you, uh, handles this with, without any issues. So, that, must, that was my last slide. Thank you. Uh, and now is the time for questions. I hope you have questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any questions? Oh. Which of the three engines that you uh, listed you're using in Halo, and what is the most complex process that you implemented? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, we are using Kamunda, the uh, engine that uses BPMN. Uh, we're using that in the hope, uh, so we're using this since we hope that it will be easier for different medical centers to describe their workflows or to configure their workflows visually. What's our most complex process? Uh, well, I would say that's the um, uh, performing of a procedure. So they start with us getting the uh, information from some, any, some external system that a patient at some point in time will have a procedure done in our center. So we continue with um, uh, registering this, uh, this procedure. We continue with uh, calling the patient, sending them notifications, scheduling the patient. Then uh, at the day of the procedure, they come. That's what I, what I described. We, and we perform the procedure. And that's a really very long running process since it can take days or weeks from us getting the, uh, the order to the actual performing of the uh, procedure. <laughs> 